Our speaker this afternoon is Mr. George Meek. Mr. Meek is a graduate of Mercer University, Macon, Georgia, where he majored in chemistry. He joined the Food and Drug Administration as an inspector in 1937. He has also held positions as a chemist, hearing officer, and food and drug officer. Mr. Meek has been stationed in Atlanta, New York City, and Cincinnati. He has been at Cincinnati since 1950. He will talk this afternoon on drug quackery. Mr. Meek. Thank you. Dr. Sinovitz, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here today to uh, take part in your uh, uh, quackery symposium. Uh, I think I, it would be, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, congratulate the university and Dr. Sinovitz uh, for their part in developing a program of this type. <coughs> I've looked over the program and I wish I could have been here to hear the speakers who have gone before uh, uh, my appearance here today. Uh, I tried to think of some stories to tell about uh, food and drug work. I can't think of any, but uh, a question of uh, communications come up, and I hope that uh, I'm able to communicate to you the things that I try to uh, say today. Uh, it reminds me of a story about the two uh, ladies who were talking one day, and one says to the other, says, uh, uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, what do you think about red china? She says, it's all right with a purple tablecloth. <laughs> so I hope that I don't uh, get off into those areas today. <coughs> Uh, I hope today to discuss with you some of the problems involved in drug quackery, to relate some of the efforts of the Food and Drug Administration to solve or alleviate the problems in this area, and to give you some specific examples of our efforts. During the last half of the, this program, uh, we will show you a film titled The Health Fall Fraud Racket, which covers all phases of quackery, but I believe it is primarily concerned in the medical quackery area. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration has always recognized the educational approach in any area that might help to solve problems where a lack of an enlightened public might perpetu perpetuate those problems. Within the last year, we have attempted to redirect our efforts in this educational approach. We warmly welcome any group uh, that might assist in this area of consumer education, and particularly those in the educational and health fields. Dr. James L. Goddard, our busy commissioner of foods and drugs, has fostered and encouraged this new approach. Now, what do we mean by medical quackery? I imagine you have already had uh, definitions of this uh, in the preceding discussions. The dictionary, however, des defines a quack as a pretender to medical skill. The word uh, charlatan is often given as a synonym. The, in popular terms, the quack is considered to be a medical swindler. The collective word quackery is a broad term. It includes a variety of misinformation concerning health, which is misleading to the public, even though there may be no deliberate intent to mislead. So today, what we are talking about is information versus misinformation in the health field, which can affect the consumer's pocketbook as well as his personal health and his safety. There has been a great deal of controversy about what quackery is. What was accepted as medical practice 100 years ago, or even 50 years ago, to a large extent may be called quackery today. There are, of course, a few instances in which folklore of bygone times was later found to have a scientific basis, but these are few and far between. Today, however, science is capable of distinguishing with considerable certainty the effective from the ineffective medication. Our laws are based on medical knowledge and distinguishes between what is legal and what is illegal. The fact that cat quackery can be put to the test scientifically and legally is a basic fact that underlines the enforcement of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in this area. It is the mutual interest of uh, all uh, health agencies, of the Food and Drug Administration, to expedite these determinations and to take effective steps against quackery both by law enforcement and by education. It has been recently estimated that the cost of medical quackery to the American public approaches a billion dollars a year. This includes the consequences of unnecessary and worthless treatment and products of every description and misinformation utilized to promote such things. 
there are no statistics to tell the cost of quackery in money, injuries, and in human life. The itinerant old-time medicine men, uh, uh, peddling herbs and spices, which were concocted in alcoholic bases usually, that cured everything from baldness to the ague, had only, has only apparently left the scene. He has reappeared with wonder drugs, which appeal to the senses and have an aura of the unknown, and he has emptied the pockets of the gullible. Well, one might say, uh, those days are gone forever, that things are different today in our enlightened age. I wish we could be that optimistic, but we must face reality. The woods are still full of uh, the same quacks and charlatans today as they were of yesteryear. They are still there, ready to play, uh, uh, prey upon the unsuspecting or frightened person who will fall for a shortcut to health. Today's frauds are more sophisticated. The modern medicine man may run a special clinic outfitted with all the modern gadgetry of a space-conscious nation. The problem demands our close attention. There are 19 million Americans of the uh, age of 65 or over. They represent about one in every 10 of our population. These people are a far richer resource uh, that we have, far richer resource than all of our mineral deposits, mountains, rivers, streams, and seashores or forests. The senior citizen population group has become a target for many health swindles. This group is particularly vulnerable to products promoted for arthritis, high blood pressure, lost manhood, and so forth. I imagine some of Mr. Lincoln's discussion this morning had to do with uh, arthritis and uh, uh, particularly the senior citizens and their problems. Let us remember as we ponder the question of medical quackery that we do so in the midst of the people who are, who are sold on health. Therefore, the possibility that they may be victimized has become greater. Our elderly population, as previously stated, is a prime target. In addition to the above, aging involves such problems as dentures, digestive upsets, obesity with its complications, the wear and tear on the body structures such as the eyes, the ears, the heart, and the joints. Chronic illness appears and cancer or the fear of cancer tends to raise its ugly head. The aging process itself may offend the ego, resulting in a frantic search for the fountain of youth. Modern medicine, public health measures, and our abundant and balanced food supply have increased the lifespan of all our people. And as a result, our elderly have become a major medical specialty. Let us look into and say she had some light on the two-sided problem of quackery. Both sides must be considered. Shedding light on problems aids in prevention. Preventative medicine is far more successful than therapeutics. The problem is one that must be approached with logic and an appreciation of the factors that nurture its growth. The freewheeling uh, pitcher in this uh, game is a promoter. He is well aware that quackery is lucrative. Uh, the most charitable analysis uh, is that these charlatans uh, saw their, salve their conscience with the outdated maxim of caveat emptor, or let the buyer beware. These purveyors of grief are sensitive to the terms and the rapid development of scientific health research. These breakthroughs create situations that are tailor-made for our curveball artist to develop a new pitch. Uh, these opportunities range from the educated and misguided uh, to do-gooders to the spectrum of the criminally motivated pseudoscientist to a highly educated scientist. The highly educated scientist has strayed from the area of their competence. In some manner, they have become detoured and isolated from the scientific community. They are prone to attack their former legitimate colleagues, <coughs> claiming opposition to progress, and likening themselves to the scientific martyrs of a lost scientific age. They loudly proclaim that the medical trust is persecuting them. However, they fail to maintain records to document their research, and I quote research. <coughs> Contrary to the principles of accepted scientific research, Complete secrecy surrounds their methods, although duplication of results by their peers is a sound approach when a therapeutic breakthrough has been accomplished. Established diagnostic methods are shunned. Pseudo-scientific literature carefully conceals false premises. Our false conclusions result in literature which, read without careful appraisal, appears to be wholly logical. 
false diagnoses are uh, frequently the result of established cures. A patient rarely questions a diagnosis, and subsequent tests by others using established diagnostic techniques, such as biopsies, reveal that the cancer is not present. The false conclusion is that the therapy had been effective, having cured the diagnosis. As a result uh, of this, the uh, theory gains wide publicity uh, from the layman by mouth-to-mouth -mouth communications and sometimes even in late publications. Snowballing public opinion establishes that the false cure as a major scientific breakthrough. The other end of the battery, however, is a catcher or the victim. Without these pawns, Quackery would wither and die. Even the educated at times are placed on the horns of a dilemma. It is difficult for, the most, for most individuals and families to face medical disaster. Incurable disease, however, must be faced. For example, the diagnosis of an early incurable uh, cancer understandably strikes unreasoning fear into the hearts of the family as well as the, uh, of the patient. These patients are faced by the alternative of either deep ray therapy or major surgery or both, and they are become panicky. Legitimate therapy uh, faces up to the problem and states the fact. Cure can never be promised, but quackery is not bound by medical ethics. The con man uh, emanates false hopes and glibly assures the victim that his pill or vaccine therapy is a sure cure as well as being easy and painless. The history of cancer quackery is replete with cases resulting in therapy. The result is, mandatory death, is a mandatory death sentence. When individuals finally face the truth, it is only human for them to grab at straws, and the promoter of quackery is adept at placing these straws on the sea of human emotion. The panic uh, response by emotional impact leads a fearful patient on safaris uh, seeking miraculous cures based on reports from friends, neighbors, and regrettably, as I said, sometimes the lay press. The emotional impact of fear robs the victim of the reason in, his subconscious, in a subconscious manner. His fears are powerful motivating forces, and when to fear is added gullibility, uh, the almost universal trait of, uh, of gambling, a clear picture of the victim of quackery unfolds. The area of quackery is broad. It contains illegal promoted food supplements for their curative powers, and the so-called health foods, reducing gimmicks, cures for alcoholism, diabetes, impotency, baldness, ad infinitum. One operation that uh, deserves special mention here was a drug promoted popularly as regimen, and this is a recently terminated case. This was a nationally advertised over-the-counter drug involving the all-too-familiar form of quackery. The illegal use of the mails, false advertising, untruthful labeling, and even falsification of scientific data were involved. The development, investigation, and discovery phase of this expose and criminal prosecution is a classic example of modern sophisticated quackery. The Food and Drug Administration, the Post Office Department, the Federal Communications Commission, the Department of Justice were all involved. Conviction uh, followed a jury trial in the United States District Court in Brooklyn, New York. The decision was unanimous, unanimously upheld by the United States Circuit Court of Appeals. The appellate court's decision was taken to the Supreme Court with the result that the High Court refused to hear the appeal. Criminal indictment followed a grand jury investigation. There were 58 counts including 18 for mail fraud, 27 on wire fraud, 12 on misbranding, one on conspiracy to violate the mail and the wire fraud statutes. The Drug Research Corporation responsible for the violation was fined $53,000. Its president was fined $50,000 and sentenced to 18 months in jail. The advertising agency which helped promote the advertising was fined $50,000. And that's the first case in which an advertising agency has been included as a principal that I can recall. And the president of the firm which conducted the fraudulent research had his sentence suspended due to a serious illness. Now, I have a press release here on the regimen uh, proposition, which I will uh, read to you at this point. This is dated January 11, 1964. Food and Drug Administration today announced a multiple seizure campaign to remove regimen tablets from the nationwide market. Regimen tablets distributed by Drug Research Corporation in New York City are labeled and nationally advertised as effective for appetite control 
and weight reduction without drastic diet changes. The drug research firm is one of the inter enterprises of John T. Andradius, also known as John Andre. The government first seized regimen tablets in February 1962 at Denver, Colorado. The seizure was contested and litigation continued in December 31, 1963. When Drug Research Corporation withdrew its opposition and agreed to destruction of the seized tablets, at the same time, the firm agreed to a permanent injunction prohibiting further interstate distribution with claims for weight control. The Food and Drug Administration charged that regimen tablets were misbranded under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and challenged the following claims made for the drug. And I quote, They will cause weight loss up to six and a half pounds in seven days and 19 pounds in six weeks without planned dieting. They will satisfy hunger. Control inhibit and shrink one's appetite, causing pounds and inches to melt away. They represent a combination of reducing drugs so amazing that one can lose weight without planned dieting while eating with gusto one's favorite foods, and they have been proved amazingly effective in clinical tests on overweight people. Also, that's unquote, also challenged are claims that weight loss will be permanent, that excessive weight makes cirrhosis of the liver more probable than in slender people, and that it has been shown that fat people are more successful, uh, susceptible to cancer than others. The Food and Drug Administration said that depositions taken since the first seizure in Denver, Colorado, showed that many persons who gave testimonials for magazine and television advertising of regimen tablets were actually reducing on starvation diets and drugs prescribed by physicians. The depositions also showed that some of the purported clinical tests conducted by promoters of regimen tablets were either not carried out at all or were falsified. And then it relates that seven, uh, 12 seizure actions had already been made in various districts, including uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. <clears throat> Another area of drug quackery is the prescribing or selling of uh, prescription drugs or other potent drugs for weight reduction on a scale far exceeding what might be expected in the normal good medical practice. Many of these problems are handled by the Food and Drug Administration's Bureau of Drug Abuse Control and others may involve medical malpractice. Food and Drug Administration in the past has developed many cases against uh, doctors who would just sell drugs over the counter without any medical diagnosis at all. And the courts have considered them uh, uh, similar to a man peddling drugs on the street corner. No doctor-patient relationship whatsoever. Another noteworthy case uh, important in the field of nutritional quackery was the prosecution of Food Plus Incorporated of Moonachie, New Jersey. The United States Third uh, Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a lower court ruling that the firm's products were misbranded as charged. Various quantities of some 40 different vitamin, mineral, and other dietary products that were seized had been linked with radio broadcast by an internationally prominently prominent, and I quote, nutritionist, unquote, Carlton Fredericks. The items were misbranded by the firm's catalog of products, which failed to bear adequate directions for use. The catalog did not indicate that the diseases and preparation that the diseases the preparations would treat or how the products were to be used. The lower court had issued an injunction against the company prohibiting it from making interstate distribution of its products. The appellate court agreed with the district court that there was a close relationship between Fredericks and Food Plus Inc. and that the firm adopted for its own uses Fredericks broadcast claims that vitamins effectively prevent and treat numerous human diseases. The appellate court further agreed that the firm intended its products to be used for these purposes for which Frederick had recommended them. We cannot emphasize too strongly the impact of cancer quackery. The American Cancer Society is inundated with requests for tests or information on secret cancer remedies. Cancer quackery is extremely lucrative and its re results are devastating. I note uh, from uh, your schedule that you have already heard discussions of what cancer quackery what is cancer and cancer quackery. The Food and Drug Administration has several tools of enforcement. Adulterated or misbranded drugs may be seized and removed from the market as contraband. Responsible individuals and firms may be prosecuted in federal court for violations of the act. A third tool of enforcement is injunctive action in which a court prohibits or demands that the responsible firm or individuals not introduce adulterated or misbranded products into interstate commerce. Some of these actions are received newspaper publicity, however many do not. Now we have taken a look at medical quackery in several of its problem forms. 
we have noted that science and the law are in general adequate to deal with most of these problems. However, much is left to be done. The light of truth and education of the public that will hold these hucksters at bay will be, uh, will be bulwarked by continued and vigorous enforcement of the law. In union there is strength, local agencies, private and city, together with national organizations such as the American Cancer Society, the Rheumatism and Arthritis Foundation, the National Health Council, the Better Business Bureau, the American Medical Association, all have supported and enforced our uh, enforcement efforts and our efforts to educate the public. I think I would be uh, remiss in, uh, if I didn't state that uh, the Food and Drug Administration works uh, very closely with uh, the local, state, and other health organizations. And many of the things that we take action against have been brought to our attention by local authorities. I know the Indiana State uh, Food and Drug Law is uh, uniform with the federal law. That means it's uh, similar as far as it can go on the state statutes. So anything that uh, we find violated that's not in interstate commerce, we turn over to state people, and they in turn notify us of products that they find violated that come from outside the state where they can't reach them. Uh, I thought that you might be interested in a few of these items that I have here on the stand to show you a few examples of the type of uh, uh, medical quackery that uh, we have. This is uh, one called a uh, monkey gland compound. <coughs> it was manufactured by Gold's Inc. of Columbus, Ohio. I know most of you are too young to remember the famous uh, monkey gland man uh, out west somewhere that was supposed to uh, graft uh, monkey glands into the uh, human body to make you stay young. But this, uh, this drug was sold uh, on that basis, and it contains such things as uh, vitamin B1, iron carbonate, nux vomica, zinc phosphide, cascarin, and diamina. And uh, so he was capitalizing on the publicity that had already been made for this product uh, some years ago. This man originally got his product. Uh, somebody in Ohio made it for him and sold it to him at Columbus, and he distributed it. He didn't go into state commerce at the time, and we had no jurisdiction because in federal law, the product has to go across the state line. For some unknown reason, we left him alone all those years. For some unknown reason, he started getting his uh, drug from Baltimore, and then we had jurisdiction. Because the law covers in misbranding of a product, any time after it, we can see, take action against it, any time after it goes into interstate commerce, you can sell it uh, five times, ten times after that, but the law still has jurisdiction. And that's one of the loopholes that was covered by a uh, recent Congress. Uh, had a call, uh, some of you may remember about that, and everybody used to ask about it. It was really a shotgun proposition for B1, B2, niacin, B6, panathenic acid, iron, manganese, calcium, and phosphorus. Uh, but uh, no claims on the label for it. His advertising claims were made in radio, newspaper, and television advertising, over which we had no control at that time. We do have limited control now, but usually newspaper, radio, television, advertising does come under the Federal uh, Trade Commission and, and not under our jurisdiction. However, <coughs> If he should recommend on here that this would treat, uh, say, uh, tuberculosis, I mean in his advertising on TV, then his, uh, the law requires that his directions for use have to give, uh, uh, tell him how to use his product to treat that condition, otherwise it's misbranded. So we have what we call the, the uh, public, I mean the uh, trade calls the pincher movement here. If you put a false misleading statement on a label, it can be uh, uh, seized. However, if you represent the, uh, uh, in your oral advertising that the product uh, uh, will be uh, uh, good for certain conditions, then don't put directions for use on here. Then it can be, uh, uh, it's violated too because you don't have directions for use for treating those conditions. This is just an example of that. We had nothing uh, wrong with this except uh, after it stayed on the market for several years, it started decomposing and then we could seize it uh, because it, it uh, didn't have the amount of B1 in that they claimed at the time. But nothing's wrong with the label as far as we were concerned. Now this is that great uh, scientific breakthrough that we have here called HOC capsules. Three capsules, only 50 cents. They're developed off and distributed by HOC Laboratories in Los Angeles, California. And uh, except for the pink elephant and the indication here, overindulgent, you're sorry to hardly know what this means, but uh, this stands for hangover capsules. And uh, it contains uh, some basic... Uh, drugs there, I think his ingredient statement says it contains B1, B2, vitamin C, and that's about it. And it made representations for this, which were, uh, which were falsely misleading because it wouldn't accomplish these purposes. That's what was misbranded. I, I don't know, but I think they're off the market. Uh, this is um, 
the royal jelly. Uh, some of you in the health field might have remembered the a big splash we had several years ago on royal jelly. Uh, they found out that the uh, queen bee, uh, because she ate royal jelly, was uh, outlived the other bees uh, by a great length of time, and she was very prolific and a very strong individual and this, that, and the other. So they uh, assumed, uh, somebody did, uh, that if it was good for the queen bee, it might be good for human beings too. And so they recommended this in their labeling for all kinds of conditions, but uh, later research and uh, inquiring into the matter uh, shows that uh, it's very good for queen bees, but it doesn't do anything for the human. So that shows you how quick, uh, I mentioned about how quickly these people jump into these fields when some of uh, it publishes some articles. Uh, this is a one you might be interested in. We were talking about uh, uh, smoking at uh, lunch today. This is called Trim Reducing Aid in Cigarettes. Uh, Curbs Your Appetite, Clinically Tested. And these were the subject of seizure up in Chicago district and a court trial. The product contains tobacco and it says combustible tartaric acid combined with tobacco and flavoring. But uh, as far as we can find out, as far as research shows, it didn't have any more uh, your weight than anything else. Uh, now, I, I talked about uh, how quickly people jump into the field. Some time ago, one of the uh, national syndicated uh, doctors uh, published an, an article when, in which he theorized that uh, man in his development uh, eventually uh, earlier came from fish and crawled out on the land and developed into animals and got into higher, higher development and eventually became a human being. So he theorized that uh, the human body should be supplied with all of the um, uh, minerals that appear in seawater. So as soon as that hit the stand, my people started putting out uh, sea salt and sea salt solutions uh, for treating all of the America's human, uh, American, uh, the human beings' uh, ills. And here are a few of the samples that we picked up. Of course, one of 18 districts that probably go with this many picked up by, by all the uh, districts of the country. But this is what we have. This a lot was seized up in Columbus, Ohio. It was quite a large lot. And uh, in adjudicating the seizure, the uh, court allowed uh, this large uh, lot, about uh, 1,500 pounds, to go to the, uh, to the what do you call it, General Services Administration, and they were going to use this to melt the uh, ice on the streets of Columbus, Ohio, around the post office. <laughs> so I think that was a, a good use to put it. Uh, I believe that uh, about uh, covers the comments that I had to make at the time, at this time. There are many other areas of quackery, and uh, I think particularly about uh, uh, the uh, the cancer uh, quacks. You've probably heard about that, but we have have had at least uh, two instances of that. Oh, this uh, milru. This product originally was put out by a, a man up in uh, Chicago, I believe, and it contains a mala herb. And I read up. Uh, I think I looked in the, the National Pulmonary about this, a dispensatory, and said it is it, a. As a uh, an herb that contains a gelatinous type of substance that had been used for mucilage. And it contains uh, iron citrate, B1, B2, and niacin, and preserved with sodium benzoate. Well, this uh, original case so went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed that this product wasn't any good for cancer. And I think the man served some deal sent us on it. Now, this was uh, put out and marketed by a man in, uh, I believe it's Boonville. Boonville, Indiana, and this man ran a uh, health food store, and he was a masseur, and would give you steam baths and massage your body and things like that, but he found out out west somewhere that this, he, somebody told him this cured cancer, so he started marketing it, and in his literature, his price list, which served to misbrand this, he says, uh, male rue, the juice of the herb rue, concentrated, found helpful in the following conditions, colitis, ulcers, piles, tumors, liver, spleen, kidney, bladder, thyroid, and asthma. Now, not only this, but he would tell you in a personal letter that he wrote to you, which became labeling under the law, that he had cured uh, uh, hundreds of tumors up in the bodies of people who uh, had used this stuff. And he was taken before uh, uh, Judge uh, Kale Holder at uh, Evansville, Indiana. And uh, we have a transcript of part of what the judge said uh, to this man. I think you'll find this interesting. Now, he's already told him how much his fine was going to be. He said, now, Mr. Roberts' organized society has progressed to the extent where they have taken away the, prescri the prescribing of medicines and for the cure of sicknesses from the layman 
and from the witch doctors of yesteryear, and we all recognize that there is still a long way to go, that the doctors don't have all the answers to everything, but organized society, the men of education in trying to fathom the future, believe that such predictions uh, for the treatment of ills should be in the hands of those educated to do so. You are not. The day of the witch doctor is gone, and because even those uh, organized, educated men, as a classification of doctors as a general class, we will say, we recognize that they don't have the complete answer to everything, yet we still think that that's the best place to leave that chore not with you. And you can't let the floundering public who are grasping at straws to make the market for you to make a little money out of it. Mr. Roberts, I don't think so, the court. Uh, well, I don't believe you were in it just for your health. Don't mislead yourself or anyone. The story of the witch doctor, and they soon convince themselves that they've got the answer, and that's what's happening to you. You stay in your own backyard. You feed these people uh, foods, if that's what they want, but don't go beyond that, and, or you are going to the penitentiary. That's it, I stay pretty close to my doctor and to my lawyer because you are going to have to make up your own mind with your lawyer and doctor and everything else. Mr. Roberts says, no, I've talked it to both and it's crystallized my idea. The court, I'm telling you, you violate this probation, you're going to the penitentiary. Now, Mr. Lopp, that's a man's lawyer. Get this man's mind straightened out. Mr. Lopp, surely, the court, I don't want to send him to the penitentiary, but that's what's going to happen to him. And you know it, Mr. Lopp, that's what's going to happen to him. If he just, with one more ad in the paper, uh, tells uh, that this is going to cure athletes, but he's going. <laughs> we understand one another? Mr. Lopp, I will advise him. And so uh, this was Judge uh, Holder uh, sitting at Evansville, Indiana.